I was out of town up until today, so I have this on my laptop. I apologize for not having paper. Um, okay, here it goes. Um, right. My name is Alex Green, and I'm a junior at the University of New Hampshire, studying political science and philosophy. I'm also a student activist and an organizer, mainly focusing on social and economic justice, the environment, and an end to all others. However, I do have to say that while I was very excited to be asked to be here today to speak with you, I did spend a good amount of time wondering what the hell is a young, white, able-bodied, heterosexual, privileged male supposed to say in an MLK celebration? <laughs> so here it goes. Um, I think that partially, if it wasn't for Dr. King, I wouldn't be up here today even recognizing my own privilege. I've learned a lot about privilege during my time as an activist and a student at UNH, and it really truly does open your eyes to a lot of the things that most of us wouldn't normally recognize on a daily basis. We've come a long way since Dr. King's time time when privilege meant that I would have had the right to vote, while others might, might not. But we still have a long way to go. A great place to start when learning about white privilege is the infamous article by Peggy McIntosh entitled Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. The article features a list of 26 examples of privilege that white folks have, including whether I use checks, credit cards, or cash, I can count on my skin color not to work against the appearance of my financial reliability. Or, I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race, just to name a <coughs> But of course, it's not just white privilege that I hold. I also carry all the other privileges stated earlier as well, including having male, able-bodied, heterosexual, and economic privileges as well. And well, great, great, great privilege comes with great responsibility, and I have found that learning about and understanding these privileges has only led me to being a better leader, organizer, and activist. I was asked to speak on why Dr. King is still so relevant today, and for me to truly cover that topic, we'd be here all day. But of course, we are on a schedule, and shortly after I'm finished, it appears that there will be a break, so I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. Um, for starters, Dr. King is most notably known for his work around civil rights, and the use of nonviolent civil disobedience to effect change, resulting in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. By the time of his death, King had been focusing more and more on ending poverty and calling for an end to the Vietnam War. King was vehemently opposed to the war, stating in 1967 that the U.S. government was, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, end quote. Unfortunately, it could be argued that the statement is still true. But primarily, King began to focus on larger and more significant moral and cultural changes. One of the main reasons why King was against the war in Vietnam was because he felt that the war took money and resources that could have been spent on domestic programs or jobs, welfare, or education. He, famous, he famously stated that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense and on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. He began to speak about the need for the unification between civil rights and the peace movements. He said, quote, there are people who have come to see the moral imperative of equality, but you cannot yet see the moral imperative of, uh, you cannot yet see the moral imperative of world brotherhood. I would like to see the fervor of the civil rights movement imbued into the peace movement to instill it with greater strength. I believe everyone who has a duty to be in both the civil rights and peace movements. But for those who presently choose but one, I would hope they will finally come to see the moral roots common to both. And so with King's opposition to the wars, with his focus on ending poverty, and his overwhelming concern for ensuring the rights of all people and restoring a true system of democracy, it's impossible for me to not relate King's legacy to the Occupy movement today. The Occupy movement truly comes from the utter frustration of the middle and lower classes in America, 99% of people. This frustration is against a system that has left them with little job opportunities, low wages, mounting debts, reductions in social services, and a political system that truly caters to corporations and the richest among us. King once stated that, quote, the Negro Revolution is a genuine revolution, born from the same womb that produces all massive social upheavals, the womb of intolerable conditions and unendurable situations. What we, are what we are witnessing today is another massive social upheaval. It is a little surreal for me to be speaking with you today inside of this building, because while I've never been in this building before, I was standing outside of it less than a week ago while Mitt Romney was inside delivering his speech after the New Hampshire primary. I was with a group of Occupy protesters from Occupy New Hampshire, and protesting outside of his speech was our final action after a week of nonstop activism, which had, termed Occupy, which had been termed Occupy the New Hampshire primary. And by the way, your campus police were very nice to us. <laughs> um, Occupy the primary's message was clear, simple, and direct. Get money out of politics. 
We knew that the Occupy movement had been criticized in the past for not having a clear message. And we knew that if we didn't have one now, focusing on the GOP primary would have been viewed by the public and the media as a bunch of ragtag leftist groups attacking Republicans. So we knew that we had to unite behind a message that we felt really focused on the fundamental problem in our society that needs to be addressed. And so we chose money out of politics because it's an issue that truly affects all sides of the political spectrum and the outcomes of all economic, social, and political issues in this country. Since the 1980s, more than 90% of the candidates who won their races were the ones who spent the most amount of money on their campaigns. And of course, the overwhelming majority of this money comes from corporate, corporate donations to political paths. Also, in addition to contributions to candidates and politicians, we all know that lobbyists to Congress are the people who truly have the ability to speak with politicians on a regular basis and influence and possibly even coerce political decisions. In 2010, there were 12,930 lobbyists who collectively spent over $3.5 billion lobbying Congress. What we are faced with is a political system that only represents the interests of the super rich and the corporations, and it's an issue that affects everyone. The Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that Dr. King was so influential in helping pass were put in place to help restore our democratic system, to instill fairness and equality, and to ensure that everyone's voice counted. But is it really a democracy today when dollars count more than votes? Is it really a democracy when the 1% of Americans who own 40% of the wealth in this country have unlimited access and influence on the president, Congress, and lobbyists alike, while the overwhelming majority of Americans are lucky to be able to pay their electricity bill to be able to see them speak on television? This was our message at Occupy the Primary, and it resonated with a lot of people. We had great media coverage, we had great conversations with passers-by, and we had numerous supporters of the presidential candidates come up to us and tell us that for once, they agreed with us. In the four months since Occupy Wall Street started, I've been extremely impressed with how disciplined the movement has been in terms of sticking to a select few core principles of participatory democracy, respect for all parties involved, and various methods of nonviolent actions and civil disobedience. I think that we can easily attribute this to the teachings and the examples provided by King and his followers. If it wasn't for the outstanding examples of campaigns fought for and won by those in the civil rights movement using methods of nonviolent civil disobedience, I don't think that they would be as widespread, as popular, or as enduring as they are today. Nonviolence is not easy, but we have learned that it is the most righteous road to take in the path of fighting for justice. King believed that nonviolent protest was the only way to gain the type of media coverage necessary to bring the struggle for, for black equality and voting rights to the national forefront. On numerous occasions, footage of police brutality against nonviolent protesters was broadcast extensively and caused national public outrage. Of course, this situation should sound familiar, as noted earlier, to the various incidents we have seen coming out of the Occupy movements with activists all over the country facing police brutality and mass arrests. As of today, there have been over 1,500 documented arrests in over 100 cities since the movement began. King said that, quote, nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time, the need for mankind to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to oppression and violence. Mankind must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such method is love. I found it interesting as I did research on King's life how many times there were references or mentions of the bridges he burned and the bad media that he garnished. When we learn about Dr. King in school, or when we hear about him in the media during this time of the year, we always hear about what a wonderful person he was and how much work he did to bring people together. Yet, time and time again, King made decisions that offended someone in one way or another. Time and time again, the media portrayed him, his actions, or his group's actions in a negative light. When King chose <clears throat> to begin focusing on the Vietnam War, he angered many of his supporters, and he lost many of his allies in the government and in the media. I think that this shows two things. One, Dr. King truly lived and preached his values, and he was unafraid of the criticism that he faced while doing so. And two, that in the end, uh, justice prevailed, and that as we all know, Dr. King is consistently portrayed in an extremely positive light regardless of how some may have viewed him or portrayed him at the time. This brings, me to, this brings to mind one of King's most famous quotes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I'd like to close by finishing where I started and talking about privilege. As a privileged activist, I have learned from my teachers and mentors that it is important for me to be an ally to those who are less fortunate or less privileged than I am. Examples come to mind of speaking out against a racist, sexist, or homophobic comment or ensuring that in meetings or in groups that all people are being properly represented and heard. However, with many of these large privileges that we carry come smaller, less obvious ones as well. For example, some of us may have the privilege to be able to move or to switch jobs. Being an American citizen allows you the privilege to leave the country and live anywhere that you like. 
And as we, had, as we head into the 2012 election cycle, I become increasingly frustrated with folks who use statements like, if X gets elected, I'm moving to Canada, or something like that. Maybe the majority of these statements are just tongue-in-cheek humor, but I still disagree with promoting the concept of abandoning those who need us the most, even if it's just a joke. There are people in this country who don't have the ability to leave, switch jobs, or start new lives for themselves in another country. There are sick people, poor people, children and their families who are struggling to survive in a country that is struggling to stay afloat. To those of you who have the ability to recognize the evils in this world and the ability to work towards correcting them, I encourage you to not abandon those abilities. If Dr. King taught us anything, it's that people who are truly committed to justice can accomplish great things. Find what you're passionate about, join a group or start one of your own, and do what you can to make this world a better place. Thank you.